and I'm going to introduce our next um, speaker and she's going to talk about our next session. So I'd like to bring up Temitayo Ishola, COO at Bikabal Media to intro her session and who she'll be speaking with. Um, and while she's coming up, um, I just want to speak a little bit more about what you're going to learn on this session. As long as commerce exists, payments will always be critical and people need more efficient and seamless ways to move money. In this session, we're going to be looking at how payment solutions are evolving on the continent to match the needs of consumers. I hope you enjoy this session. Sit back and enjoy. Thank you, Temi Tayo. Thank you so much, Carmen. And good morning, everyone. Thank you all once again for choosing to spend today with us. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. We're kicking off today with the first panel titled Payments, the Big Connector. And with me, I have four panelists here today that are big operators in this space to speak to us about what exactly is happening cur currently in the payment space in Africa and what we should look forward to in the future of the payment space. Uh, so physically here with me today, I have Akshay Grover, the CEO of Salient. A round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome, Akshay. Great to have you. Yes, right over there. Um, and also, I have Yakobo Singer, the president of D-Local, also present here with me today. It's great to have you with us, Yakobo. Welcome. And then we have two people joining us virtually. The first being Alicia Levine, who is the COO of Chipper Cash. Oh, we have Michael Bauer. <laughs> Hi, Michael. Um, he's the group product manager at Yoko. And there we go, Alicia Levine, who is the COO of Shipper Cash. And thank you all once again for joining us today. All right, how's everyone doing? How's your morning? Thank you guys for being here early and being the first panelist. So thank you for this. But how's everyone doing? How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good, pretty good. OK, so I'm truly excited for the conversation we're about to have. But before we jump right in, I'm very keen to know what our African, what our footprint on the continent is. So basically, how many countries on the continent have we all been to? I will go first. I'm ashamed to say, but I've only been to four countries on the continent, which is a shame because I was born and I was raised here, but it's something I'm swiftly trying to correct. So I'll go to you, Akshay. How many con countries have you been to on the continent? In Africa, I would say about between 25 and 30, I would imagine. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. And what's your favorite thus far? Nigeria? <laughs> <laughs> um, if, I, if I discount South Africa um, for a moment, wow. um, then I would say, um, I guess my favorite city is still Nairobi, which is where I live. Yeah. Uh, uh, number two could be Lusaka in Zambia. Okay. Uh, Lagos is not on that list. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Lagos, are you going to uh, take that from you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, only because it reminds me of my own hometown, which is Mumbai. Uh, and and, and it's, it's got a lot of similarity with it. Yakubo? So in Africa, we are today in 12 countries. OK. Uh, but we cover globally over 37 countries today. Cool. So three main regions, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. So yes. And I cannot list any particular country I have preference. Wow. Fair, so fair. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll let that slide. Each we'll country is similar. Be, he's being diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> Each country. So now I'm, I'm, a, I'm in Cape Town in South Africa. Yes. Uh, so I really like it. Yes. Uh, but uh, business wise, I think each country is different and he saw, he, it has its own singularities. Of course, of course. Michael, how many countries have you been to on the continent? I was just trying to count. I think it's about eight, um, and I lived in in Mozambique for a while, uh, up in, in northern rural Mozambique, and that was a pretty special experience. So, uh, other than South Africa, where I grew up, um, I would say Mozambique is, is up there for me. Alicia, and I believe I've been to nine countries on the continent, and near and dear to my heart is also Kenya because I spent a number of years living in Nairobi. All right, perfect. So it's, it's, a second, it's a second home to me, definitely, still. All right, I see a lot of Nairobi, but it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'll forgive you. <laughs> I've also visited Lagos. Um, the traffic <laughs> is astounding. <laughs> All right, fair. Anyway, so I'm truly excited to have you guys on here, but let's jump right in. 
So as you all know, today we're going to be talking about you know, the payment sector, which you all play in. Um, and I would say it could be argued to be one of the most pivotal innovations we're experiencing in the continent. I know we're seeing a lot of you know, innovations happen in different spaces in commerce, but payments are the big connector. There is no commerce without payments, and plugging those gaps are basically one of the biggest push to facilitate you know, the move of commerce on the continent. So, Jacobo, um, we've seen a lot of you know, the rise of Africa, we've seen the rise and impact of African payment providers like Flutterwave and Paystack on the continent. Um, but I want to know, what is the disruption or differentiation that what is the what, sorry? The differentiation that <coughs> the local is bringing to the continent or has brought to the continent? Sure. So the differentiator basically is uh, we bring all the global merchants uh, that they don't have presence in the continent, in the region and we localize them into each of the countries. So we offer to those global merchants uh, to collect the local payment methods, the local currency, while probably not having presence. Uh, so the differentiator for, for all of them, in between, uh, among the other, the other players, it's we capture merchants that are not within Africa, and we help them to expand and to land into Africa, offering uh, merch online merchants to process payments with verb card in Nigeria, or to pay with M-Pesa in Kenya, or to pay with uh, foreign Egypt, or do EFTs in South Africa. That's the really added value. It's connecting merchants and consumers, and giving the merchants the access uh, to their consumers through local payment method in local currency with their daily uh, payment options. Thank you. So something interesting happened. I know we all, we're all aware of the, you know, the Central Bank of Nigeria's limits on you know, spending uh, USD transactions in an IR card and recently there's been word going around that even the previously touted $20 has now been dropped to basically zero so what impact is that going to have on D-Local's you know ability to kind of make that local uh, bring that local presence for the international partners if, if anything it's, it's becoming super positive uh, to us because basically Nigerian people for example they are not allowed to spend internationally uh, with their local cards because the restriction in the US dollar so there is more need of localizing those operations and that basically we do. I, I, I remember a, a tweet that, I, that KK that I, say her, I, I saw her around a few months ago saying uh, that she, she was tired of creating dollar virtual cards in order to spend internationally uh, and uh, she was looking and asking for fintechs to allow global merchants uh, to spend with a local NIDA card, that's what, that's what we do. Yeah. Uh, so basically that's what we do. We enable those Nigerian consumers uh, to spend with their NIDA card in global merchants. That's perfect, thank you so much. Um, so Michael, what differences do you see between the merchant payment space in South Africa and the other African markets that Yoko might be looking to enter? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, South Africa is uh, an, an interesting market um, in, in many respects. It's, it's the tale of, of two nations. We've, we've had an interesting history. Um, and you have uh, very developed markets running alongside kind of very underdeveloped markets. Uh, and, and that's a, a challenge in, in terms of creating real inclusion and, and real access. There is payment infrastructure in South Africa and there is, uh, there is access but many, many people are, are excluded from that. So in many respects, it's a, it's a great market to learn what creating access looks like, what creating inclusion looks like. Um, and we're, we're hoping that we can learn some lessons in, in South Africa and, and uh, take that out into, into other markets. Um, yeah, it's, it's really about learning how to, how to include and, and bring in. Um, that's what we, we are aiming to do. Thank you so much, Michael. And what would you, what would you say has been the biggest lesson, like uh, in your inclusion, your merchant inclusion efforts in South Africa thus far? Sure. I mean, for, for me, it's it's just about getting on the ground and understanding what the, the problems are um, at at the actual point of sale, at the actual business. These are not aggregate problems. These are human problems. Um, I think liquidity and and access to funds in the payment flow is such an important one. Um, any kind of delay in, in merchants getting access to money that they've taken is, is really going to be a blocker for them. So just creating as, as uh, yeah, looking at looking at products and flows that, that enable merchants to access their money as quickly as possible is really important. Perfect. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, so ChipperCast has been known has been known for to be a platform to help move money across town, across Africa, and across the ocean. Um, so Alicia, I have a question for you. Earlier this year, we saw Afrex Sims uh, launch the Pan African Payment and Settlement System, and I want to know what impact do you see PAPS having on the future of cross-border commerce in Africa and on your business specifically? Yeah, so I think as probably a lot of you know, uh, Trevor Cash, really the core problem that we're trying to solve is lowering the friction and the cost of sending money cross-border in Africa. And one of the main reasons that there's so much friction is because essentially anyone that's trying to do cross-border in Africa has to do integrations within each market that has, has different regulatory frameworks, different uh, infrastructure, and it becomes a really, really uh, difficult uphill battle. So anything that's going to happen from a regulatory perspective, from a technology perspective, that's going to really lower the barriers to entry for companies like Chipper Cash, and also, to be honest, for competitors, I think is going to benefit everybody in the ecosystem. Perfect. Thank you so much. We're all looking for, I know it's been rolled out now in West Africa, so I guess the rollout con continent-wide would be very exciting for all of us. Um, so Akshay, we've been seeing, we saw, we've been seeing some trends globally, like we saw JP Morgan Chase acquire like a payment player, Renovite. Uh, I just wanted to know, do you expect such acquisitions also happening on the continent by traditional banks when they realize, you know, they might have to catch up to the payment operators that are, you know, burgeoning in the, in the ecosystem? And do you, basically, yeah, what impact do you see that having? Do you see similar trends to happen within the continent? Or what are your thoughts? Um. Do I, do I think it's possible? I would say definitely possible. Uh, do I see large international banks doing that in Africa? Answer is probably no. Do I see uh, groups that are already have a presence in Africa today, which could be international, you know, uh, they could potentially be parties who are interested to acquire businesses but I think I think where the challenge has been really is you know is the difference in DNA between a lot of the traditional banks and fintechs and I think the question is not whether there would be somebody to acquire or not the question is can you make that acquisition work because culturally the DNA the way we are built, the way we act, the speed at which we operate is so, so different, right? Um, that I see a lot of challenges when, when you try and accomplish the, the same thing via that model. I think the other issue is also that the target company, which is a fintech, does he then get impacted because of being under a banking license? And does that also inhibit, in a way, um, the operating environment or the operating framework for the fintech. So do I think it's possible? Answer is yes. Uh, will it be successful? Doesn't look easy. Fair. Thank you very much. Um, so now I have a final question for you before we jump into the Q&A. Uh, so basically the purpose of this is the future of commerce in Africa, yes? I want to know from each of you, what is one key trend that you foresee over the next 12 to 24 months in the commerce space, in the digital, digital commerce space on the continent? Go for it. Go, go, go. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I think for, for me, I, you know, I think for us, we, we're seeing uh, one or two very strong underlying themes. And I think the one opportunity which we feel very optimistic about is um, lending using our payment platform. And um, lending could be buy now, pay later for consumers who are coming online to purchase an airline ticket as an example on our platform. We are processing the payment, but we have the ability to offer an equated monthly installments mechanism to the user so that you can drive demand up. And then on the converse side, which is lesser on the global merchants, but Cellulint, for example, also caters to a lot of large local merchants. Um, you know, as, as an example, um, Chicken Republic or Domino's Pizzas, like the chain of Domino's Pizzas, right? And what we find is that a lot of these businesses 
have working capital requirements and because we as a business are capturing data on their transactions and have access to uh, the ability to let's call it credit score them right uh, we think there's an opportunity for us to be able to provide capital via the banks um, to some of these merchants so the, to me that is the one theme that i think um, is a very substantial theme and i expect a lot of um, progress and action to happen in that over the next 12 to 18 months thank you sure oops <laughs> So a few, few things to mention. I was going to mention by now by letter, so <laughs> I won't repeat it, but I see by the, the revolution of by now pay letter solutions with, around the world, I think probably will land into the, the continent as well. And each of the countries will probably develop their own by now pay letter solutions and, and credit and loan uh, solutions. But, uh, but I also see a few more things that uh, I think will, will become happening in the, in the near future. Uh, if we look outside of Africa and we look at countries such as India, Brazil, uh, as two big countries, one Asia and Latin America respectively, central banks have been playing a very important role in financial inclusion, uh, developing payment solutions uh, like UPI in India and PIX in Brazil. So I think uh, on that side, Africa will start implementing, each of the central banks will start implementing those integrated payment solutions in each of the countries. Some of them already gave some steps towards that direction, the case of NIBS in Nigeria or Instapay in Egypt or RPP in South Africa. But, but we see that happening more and more, given more because of the success on, on, on other countries. I think that we continue to see more and more fragmentations on the payment space. Uh, so. While probably few might think uh, that payments will get will start consolidated consolidating, we think that there will be more and more fragmentation. There will be more and more payment options to the users. Uh, so that's why the, the reason why we we get to to be here to aggregate all of those local payment methods uh, to to our option. And, and last thing, it's uh, we see more of the international companies, the global uh, enterprise which didn't have strong presence in the market, uh, start coming and localizing and investing uh, into each of the countries. If you go around the street, you will see Amazon Prime, uh, Prime Video all, all around. That means that those players are getting solutions uh, within the country and they start investing. Uh, just to, for, as a way of example, we, we just announced, for example, Microsoft and Google expanding into, uh, with us within a partnership into the region, so we see those trends happening in the, in the near future. Thank you. I have a question, actually. I know one of the things Celiant is solving for is fragmentation. What do you have to say to Jacobo saying, you know, he foresees a lot more fragmentation coming into the market? Sorry, sorry, is the question? No, I'm saying I know one of the things Celiant is solving for is like fragmentation in different payment uh, forms across yeah. the continent. And I know Jacobo is saying, you know, he foresees a lot more fragmentation, like a lot more different kind of players coming to play. I'm just wondering what are your thoughts on that as the outlook? Uh, I agree with what Jacobo is saying that there will be more fragmentation and the fragmentation is only beneficial for the end consumer because what you're trying to do or what the different options are giving you is to say I can do one, two, three, four and five, right? The question is like, I don't know if you actually today, if you go to Ghana and Accra and you walk into uh, a Carrefour or a ShopRite or whatever is uh, one of the big supermarkets, you would see about five POS machines. You would see a logo for MTN, for Airtel, for whichever is the third operator I'm forgetting right now. You would also see the respective bank logos saying QR code for Stanbic, QR code for APSA, etc, uh, etc. Et so that's kind of what you see when you walk into a store in Ghana. Uh, it looks to me like that would pretty much happen everywhere. Kenya could be a bit challenging for very different reasons. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I think in all the other markets, we're going to see that level of fragmentation. And this same fragmentation would also appear online. Um, and so, as Jacobo said, fully agree, people like Cellulant, who are integrating and like DLocal, who are integrating all these local payment methods, 
it becomes all the more interesting because then as a merchant you're coming to one person rather than trying to go to seven people to solve the problem for you perfect thank you um, so I actually have a slightly different view on the fragmentation if, if you no <laughs> yeah, please go on go on hop in. <laughs> no, no, okay. go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah so I, I think it depends on the industry and sort of the or the segment of the industry in a sense so I think from a chipper perspective and from a cross-border consumer perspective, I think actually you're gonna see a reduction in fragmentation because as companies, a lot of companies in the last sort of one to two years who sort of got maybe early investments in this sort of you know world of easy money in the last two years, had enough money to kind of, and enough investment to start get going um, to a certain level, but then it becomes really, really challenging when you try to scale particularly cross-border, particularly operating in multiple uh, markets, uh, getting regulatory approval, getting the right partnerships, et cetera. So I think you might see fragmentation on a local level, but on a cross-border pan-African level, I think you might actually see more consolidation. Perfect, thank you. Do you have any other trends you foresee, Alicia? Uh, I, I mean, again, I'm coming a little bit more from the consumer perspective. So I think that you have consumers that are expecting sort of a level of um, easiness of onboarding and uh, user experience that they would have in a lot of other industries or in sort of other sort of apps, mobile apps that they're using where they can onboard in you know, two minutes or less. They can get bespoke recommendations based on past usage, based on data that um, the provider might have from other data sources that know something about them or know something about their banking situation or their risk, their risk profile, et cetera. So, I think it's just further consumerization of the user experience in financial services um, that customers are just more and more um, expecting in a sector or an industry that previously was quite traditional that, that like, you know, sort of a, a high friction sort of um, experience that I just think that customers are expecting more from financial services providers. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alicia. Michael, we did not forget you. <laughs> What are your thoughts and the key trends you know to look out for in the next couple of months, the next one to two years? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, to echo part of what uh, Yakova was saying, um, central bank involvement and, and the release of new rails uh, like RPP in South Africa is going to be really interesting. It's going to be really interesting to see how that becomes commoditized and exposed to the market on maps, um, how peer to peer payments and kind of business uh, payments start to, to merge into, into one is going to be an interesting uh, thing to keep an eye on. And then I think the the bigger thing for me is, is around payments is one part of an ecosystem. Um, very rarely are merchants on the ground trying to solve for just payments uh, in, the, in the singular sense. It's about, I think, bundling a number of products um, into kind of a coherent integrated uh, feature set that solves a number of different jobs to be done for, for customers on the ground, um, both from the end consumer point of view, but, but particularly for the merchants. Um, I think, yeah, payments products are going to have to start looking at, at how we integrate and, and collaborate with uh, other parts of the FinTech ecosystem. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michael. Okay, now, so hi, audience people, it's your time. Um, we're moving into a Q&A session, and I'm sure you're keen to ask our panelists some questions, so um, the floor is open. Also, you are able to drop you know, questions on Slido, so we're also able to pull that up. Okay, while we wait, I have actually one more question that I can throw at you guys. I want to know what's next for each of you. I know everyone is expanding in different ways, be it geographically, be it product-wise. I want to know what's next for, for Cellulant, what's next for Chipper Cash, what's next for D-Local, what's next for Yoko? I will let you start, Jacobo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, for us, um, I think, uh, you know, we are already quite deeply entrenched in Africa. Um, and last, between last year and this year, we've already opened nine new African markets where we have licenses, um, integrations with local players, etc. So at least at this point, into going into 2023, um, I think our agenda is really to use that network 
much better for our merchants and to monetize that presence that we've already built. Uh, the exception to that is that uh, we're looking to also attack the MENA region very aggressively now. So we just opened a an off uh, we just opened a company in UAE and got the relevant licenses in Dubai. Um, and I expect that some of that would also start happening in addition to Africa. So it looks like the near term might be for us that if there is any geographic expansion, it might be Middle East Africa and a little bit of South Asia, India, Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, because uh, we're seeing a lot of demand for particularly from some of the remittance businesses uh, where we're doing payouts for those markets. Thank you. Sure. So for us, it's around three main pillars. Uh, first, it's continue opening markets. Uh, again, the local has today 37, uh, we're processing 37 countries. Uh, there is one very strong value proposition for our merchants is that they are integrated to a single API. So as long as we continue expanding to new markets under that API, under that agreement, they manage to get to land into that country as well. So for us, it's very important to make sure we continue expanding uh, into more emerging markets. Uh, in Africa a lot, in Asia as well. Uh, in Africa, we are today in 12 uh, countries. We pretend to continue expanding. Uh, second pillar, it's around onboarding merchants, continue onboarding merchants into the region, uh, mostly. Merchants that they are connected to us, but they are not processing yet uh, locally in Africa. Make sure we manage to bring them uh, to localize their payment methods and their collections uh, and their payouts as well uh, into the continent. Uh, and, and, and in line with onboarding merchants as well, it's also capturing African merchants which want to go outside of Africa. Uh, that's very important. We, also ma we are also planning to help African companies which are starting out of Africa to expand into Asia, to expand into Latin America, to expand to the world. Uh, so we, we are working on that very, very strongly. Uh, and the third one is uh, making sure we continue a building product and solution along the customer needs. We need to stay at the far, far, forefront of innovation for customers and make sure we are delivering every single payment option and financial infrastructure that the local consumers expect from their merchants. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael, so what's next for Yoko? Yeah, so Yoko is an exciting point in its journey. I think we have a strong brand in South Africa. Um, we are a fairly well-known name. If you walk around, you can see our, our devices in, in many stores. Um, there are obviously expansion plans into Africa. We're looking uh, north from, from our humble beginnings in, in SA uh, into what's next on the continent. But I think for the very near term, um, it's about taking our feature set, and like I said earlier, understanding that it's not about being uh, the, the cool blue card machine company. Um, it's about being an ecosystem that really addresses a number of jobs to be done uh, for merchants on the ground. And so in the super near term, it's about consolidating our product offering and making that experience seamless and, and beautiful and accessible. Um, with our current feature set, so our in-person payments, our online payments, and our capital product, making those really accessible, uh, really seamless for, for merchants on the ground. Um, and that's what we're leaning into in the, in the near future. Um, and then obviously expansion plans feed out of that. What's the first country you guys are looking to expand to? Can you speak on that? <laughs> or is it top secret? Uh, I'm not sure it's top secret, um, but there are a number of markets that we're evaluating um, that are, are still kind of in, in progress. All right, perfect. Thank you. And Alicia? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a lot of the same things that have already been said here. So um, just sort of very quickly, expansion, so launching more corridors um, that will add value to the platform for our customers. Um, and two, again, just focusing, focusing on this amazing customer experience. I mean, we've been building fast and furiously in the last four years. Um, so really, really making sure that our core product is super solid, super strong, that we have, um, you know, I'd love to say we have five nines always, always up and, you know, customer gets onto the app and 
Um, they can do anything they want to do without any friction or out and you know, without any challenges at all whatsoever. But I mean, we're still working towards that. So that's a it's a massive focus for our team in 2023. Perfect. Thank you. I see we got some questions on Slido. Can we have them pulled up, please? All right. So the first question is for you, Jacobo. For DLocal, how will a foreign merchant who gets paid with Naira repatriate the proceeds? Sure. I think it's a, it's a question we get every day <laughs> <laughs> uh, when speaking about Nigeria and, uh, and Naira. Uh, but basically, it's our responsibility to make sure we settle the merchant in US dollar abroad. Uh, so that's part of the, of the service as well, right? It's not just collecting the Naira, it's also repatriating the funds. So that's also part of the, the local service. Uh, so basically for a merchant, they connect to us, we will collect the Naira locally, we will work on the repatriation of funds, and we'll make sure we settle the merchant uh, abroad in US dollars. Uh, then we work locally with many financials and, and regulated entities in order to get liquidity. Uh, but that's something we do a lot. It's, that's a, a key value, a key part of our, our business in the world. We work in emerging markets or liquidity, repatriation of funds, exchange control is something we are very used to. Uh, think, of in, think as India, think as South Africa, think as Brazil, think as Argentina, think as uh, Morocco, Egypt, uh, all those countries, they have very strong Nigeria as well. Of, 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 all those countries have, are, are very strict in terms of repatriation, repatriation of dollars, and that's what we, we resolve for our merchants. So for our merchants, to conclude, they get the settlement in US dollar abroad, the local will take the, the responsibility of flowing those funds out. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, can we have the slider board up, please? All right, perfect. Uh, I will speak to, I'll speak on the one from Mac Konnichiwa. Sorry, apologies. Um, so question for you, Akshay. How close are we to building our own payment network for Pan-African payments to reduce our reliance on SWIFT? Um, I mean, PAPS is a great initiative. Uh, we ourselves are um, in a conversation with them to integrate into their platform. Um, is it something that's, like, from, from what I see right now, I think we might still be quite some many months before it becomes meaningful. Um, but that problem of, let's call it, bypassing the SWIFT is already work in progress. I mean, today at Cellulint, we already do that. Um, so, you know, some of our large merchants, um, global merchants who, let's say somebody like uh, w one of the ride hailing apps who needs to make payments to 5,000 drivers for their commission, which needs to get paid out every day. I mean, Cellulint does that today with or without the SWIFT effectively because um, funds are received by us and then we use the local payment infrastructure that we've usually built either proprietary infrastructure into the bankings, into the banks or uh, wherever there are banking switches or where there are direct integrations to mobile network operators. Uh, we would be making payments to more than 200 different terminating points on a daily basis. So in a way, to a great extent, we are not using SWIFT at all, even though the payment is actually coming from a global merchant outside of Africa. Um, and the payments are being received on a daily basis. Thank you very much. Sorry, the slide up word. Just two seconds. Okay. Um, what, okay, there we go. What are the cultural impediments towards BNPL in Africa, and can BNPL really take off on the continent? So this is open to any one of the panelists. So Alicia, Michael, also feel free to chime in, and as well as Jacobo. Uh, I can take that, I mean. If, okay, perfect, there yeah. you go. Uh, are there impediments? Um, I would say, in fact, that most consumers would be very happy if you told them at the point of sale that there is credit available, yeah. Uh, the issue is actually for the guy who is giving credit because uh, the challenge is how do I assess your credit worthiness on the basis of 
what data do I access uh, to actually assess your credit worthiness. Um, there are countries, um, many countries which are now beginning to make um, tax identification linked data uh, available as a source that can be tapped. Yeah, that can be one source. Another source which is more big data around saying, you know, whose consumer are you? You know, if you're buying an airline ticket, are you a frequent flyer? Um, do I have details of what tickets you've booked over the last 12 months as an example, right? And does the service provider who's processing that transaction actually have access to that data to be able to assess credit worthiness? So, so my take is that the challenge is not an impediment from the consumer standpoint, it's actually from the credit giver standpoint, which has to be overcome. Thank you very much. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Apologies for the delay. Perfect. Um, okay. So I will take the one from Gavin. Or not. <laughs> I would take the one from Obina. Okay. How has public policy and regulatory issues affected your businesses across Africa? And how are you able to predict slash preempt problematic regulatory changes? Yeah. Jacobo, yes. Go ahead. They start? Yeah. So, uh, one of the, of, of the most important things uh, when, when coming to a continent is it's understanding the regulation. Uh, it's Understanding each country regulation and, and policies, it's, it's very important. We have always stayed in, like uh, super up to date on, the, on, the, on that sense because we have seen the same happening in our countries. Uh, so uh, we have seen this, the importance of regulation in Latin America, in Asia, when, before uh, getting into, into Africa. So for us, it has been always a priority to stay on, in front of, uh, of regulations and making sure we get the right level of licenses uh, in each of the countries. It, it is possible to know it, yes, for sure. Uh, each country it has its own, regulator, its own regulation. Sometimes our regulations are complex to understand and that's why merchants don't want to do it by themselves and they want to uh, get with a player like, like, like us. Uh, but, but it's super important that you have people in the ground uh, experts in the ground understanding regulations and make sure that the company is up to date in terms of licenses, regulatory framework, etc. Uh, so, uh, yep, that's perfect. Thank you. And, and I think a few comments, happy to make a few comments from my side. So, I think that we also talk internally about regulation in relation to regulators as a competitive advantage at times. So, I think there's, there's always this sort of um, narrative that regulators are. <laughs> you know, slowing down business, but it, but I think that that narrative isn't always true um, and that building strong relationships with regulators actually can be a massive competitor, uh, competitive advantage. Um, and then second, I think that, again, it's relationship with regulators. We've had regulators who have come to us asking to learn more about crypto. So building relationships where it's actually symbiotic and where the regulators proactively really want to learn about what's happening in the industry. What are the trends? What are you seeing? Um, it's, there's a lot of positives that happen there as well, and I think that's, um, that, that story doesn't get told enough. Thank you very much, Alicia. And I think we will take one last question on Slido. I think someone needs to give production some coffee, please. <laughs> question asked earlier, do you see PAPS and the entire Africa ne networks framework succeeding in Africa? That's a very it's a, it's a hard question. Uh, hard to comment, but I think I, 
uh, the hopes are high. I mean, I think the issue is, where are the challenges of doing it? I mean, I think the challenge of doing it is that when, when people implemented it, if, for example, uh, a single framework in the EU, uh, they use now a common system, right? Uh, but you see it's a single currency and that makes life very, very easy for cross-border settlements, right? So their ability, you, you can't really compare that to when you think about Africa because now you're talking about cross-border, different currencies, different demand supply. Uh, conceptually, the netting position, which means net off, should work very well. Uh, conceptually, the idea that I don't need to first convert to US dollar and then convert back into the, uh, into the second currency is a great concept and it might take away some pain on the US dollar liquidity problem that we keep talking about in our respective currencies. I think the question is really that, can you bring together so many different diverse interests onto the table and actually converge on this one, right? Uh, that's where I see the challenge. I don't think I can comment on whether it's gonna happen or not. I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful like everyone else in Africa that it might. That's fair. Any other thoughts? All right. Thank you guys so much. We've come to the end of our session. I want to thank you all, to my panelists, first of all. Thank you guys for being here with me today. Thank you, Alicia and Michael, for joining me virtually. And also thank you to the audience for your questions. Um, so we're going to quickly move on to the next session. And in the next session, we're going to be looking at the critical role of last mile delivery platforms in facilitated e-commerce. Uh, we're going to be joined by Abraham Augustine, who is a senior reporter at TechAbout, to kind of take us through this. Thank you guys so much once again, and I will see you all in a bit. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.